Um, I'm not, I've got a very varied audience, it occurs to me, and uh, I don't want to be too technical or too presumptive about you know, knowledge of qualifications, etc., so I'll go through it. And uh, MA, Master of Arts, so not acoustic, but arts, why am I parading as an acoustician? Um, it's actually because um, Oxford University was invented before sciences, so you get Master of Arts degrees there and Bachelor of Arts etc. Um, and uh, that's even in physics and uh, similarly for the uh, DPhil degree, everyone, every other university calls it a PhD. Um, now I'm a member of the Institute of Physics, um, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology, a um, member of the Institute of Acoustics which is the UK organisation and also an associate member of the Acoustical Society of America. Um, they invent adjectives. I don't think acoustical, they might have ED. That may seem a strange slide to start with on acoustics, and uh, I am an objective acoustician, um, but I want to express my concerns about what happens when you don't do the acoustics properly. And uh, the first item is asbestos. Because the research wasn't done properly on asbestos, was it? And have you got mesophilia and uh, things like that? And the others know far more about than I do. Next one, didn't mean to do two, but we've got the Radiant Girls, um, which you may be well aware of as well. Between the wars, there were girls working, and I mean girls, quite young women working in the factory, painting the watch faces with uh, radium paint. And uh, to paint them accurately, they had to lick, well, didn't have to, but they chose to lick their brushes to a point, as one does, and uh, any watercolour enthusiasts will know. And uh, they ingested very small amounts of radium, but um, it was enough to make uh, the majority of them seriously ill and kill some of them. Um, and very sad. Um, but the reason why it's relevant here is because the people running the factory, uh, the proprietors, their employers, did not um, take their complaints seriously. And when they were diagnosed with uh, radium poisoning, because of the radioactivity of the radium, um, actually um, concealed medical reports and also spread the rumours that the problem was they were a loose lot loose living lot and they were suffering from syphilis. The tobacco industry, I don't really need to say very much about that, but I, I do know that still in 2010, the official statement um, on this from British American Tobacco was that um, there is no uh, proven connection between tobacco and lung cancer. I don't know what degree of proof they were after. Thalidomide, again, I won't put on that because we all know the story, I think. A little bit different, this, but um, it's, uh, this is just, if you like, cheating for corporate greed and uh, also cheating possibly future generations because they're cheating um, not just on the claims they make about the car, but on the fact that they are polluting more than they say, and uh, thereby increasing climate change possibilities. Primados is a newish one, and it sort of shows us that nothing's really changed very much. Um, excuse me if I ask for a show of hands every now and then, but um, who's, um, apart from those engaged in the medical profession, who's heard of Primados? No. Well, I better tell you what it is, and uh, it's a little bit like the Thalidomide case. It was a, a pregnancy uh, detection pill, and uh, it was sold, and uh, the young ladies could find out whether or not their indiscretions had led to a pregnancy. They were told that uh, if, if they took the pill and had a bleed afterwards, they knew they were not pregnant, and uh, by and large it worked quite well. But, the problem was that it also uh, produced abortions. And uh, the, a lot of the people that were taking the pill were not 
wanting an abortion, so they wanted a child. So that wasn't too good. Uh, but what made it worse? And it was uh, the company I will identify was Bayer, an American, uh, sorry, a German drugs company, I believe. Um, but what made it worse was that um, that same company was selling the same drug, presumably in a higher dose, um, to Asian countries for the purpose of procurement of abortions. And that's what it looks like. The effects were very, very similar as, uh, as a layman, um, as far as my reading goes, to those from the Midnight. And for some reason, it hasn't sort of received nearly as much attention. Um, wind turbines, I'm not going to make a direct comparison because I'm convinced that there are a large number of people working for the wind industry um, that are um, in, entirely um, decent guys. Um, full of integrity and all the rest of it. Um, probably the vast majority of them. Um, there are also people working for the wind industry who are extremely clever. And unfortunately, I don't know quite so many uh, to which both those descriptions would apply. And that does make my job very difficult. Right, back on into the technical stuff, which is probably where I would have started. Um, many of you will know the name of Dr. Leventhal, and uh, I'm not sure which glasses I want because I can't read my own notes if I step back. Uh, I'll read them from the board. Um, I can state quite categorically that there is no significant infrasound from current designs of wind turbines. Um, my statement is rather different. I firmly believe the entire cause of wind turbine syndrome is the very high level of infrasound energy emitted by wind turbines. Now, there may actually be some symptoms um, which are in, caused by a very low frequency sound rather than infrasound. Um, apart from that, I have no caveat to apply. Now, I'm not going to read that out, but I am going to ask you all to read it out to yourselves. That is the opening paragraph of a learned paper from the, the notorious, um, uh, sorry, the well-known Dr. Leventhal, um, who is an acquisition who works um, frequent, frequently, if not exclusively, for the wind, in, wind uh, energy industry. And uh, what I have to say about him is that I disagree. But uh, this is a, a worrying move. It was presented at the uh, 2017 a wind turbine noise conference in Rotterdam. And that's the major biennial conference of the wind industry. Um, what he's actually saying is, uh, as I said, yeah, it's all your own fault. Um, now, the, the industry actually explains this by stating that those who complain have got some other reasons to dislike the turbines. And uh, they even require a medical sounding phrase um, to do this, they call it the nocebo effect. Um, and uh, obviously you won't find a nocebo effect used because um, if you think about it, um, any medical trial which uses the nocebo effect um, would not get past an ethics committee. But that's beside the point to extent. <coughs> This is um, a, a Danish Ming farmer. Um, now, I don't approve of Ming farming, but that's entirely irrelevant. He actually seems to be quite a decent guy anyway. And uh, he had uh, his Ming farm um, only about 400 meters away from uh, a wind farm 
which was uh, four Estes turbines. I think they were United, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, United, I think they were. And he found that as soon as it was commissioned and switched on, the links started fighting amongst each other, and uh, then uh, he panicked and went round to the uh, developer or the owner, the operator, and uh, said that, uh, look, you've got to switch those off, all my links are sort of killing each other. And the operator panicked a bit and actually did switch off, which is amazing. <laughs> um, I don't think it's happened before that way, but it did, and uh, they stopped fighting. That um, that's all right. You can switch it back on again. It's possible that that's what the problem is, but no one will ever be able to prove it, which is possibly correct, depending on what level of proof you're looking for. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, he switched it back on again, and guess what? The link started fighting again, and uh, he was able to sort of uh, sort that out to some extent, and he moved his link farm, etc. But then um, the after the mating season, the appropriate period after the mating season, he found that uh, he was getting a lot of stillbirths and a lot of uh, you know, preterm abortions. Um, and uh, the actual abortion rate went up from his normal 5% um, up to 30%. Which is um, Melvin's neck of the woods. The sheep concerned um, actually suffered a very similar change. Um, what we were told was the um, Good night, say which wind farm it is. May I say which wind farm it is? It was a bigger fen wind farm. And uh, it, the farmer was actually in our audience um, at a, a different meeting. And he came up to me afterwards and volunteered the information that the abortion rate of his sheep um, had gone from five, no, he said five to ten percent up to thirty percent. Um, and I was a bit horrified by the five to ten percent, but um, he was you know, financially um, obviously affected pretty seriously by the 30%. Um, he didn't want to go public because that was his livelihood and no one would buy his sheep if they knew that they had those sort of problems. Um, uh, it's just 1,600 anecdotes on the mink farm and 30% uh, on the, the sheep it doesn't seem anecdotal to me, but if they want to say it's anecdotal, then papers on pigs and geese um, have actually been printed in the Polish veterinary journal, the leading Polish veterinary journal, which is properly reviewed, peer-reviewed, and it is a learned journal. So there's two papers there that certainly show that pigs and geese are affected. Neither of them were killed in this case, but the pig suffered from severely retarded growth, or almost stopped growth, and the geese um, similarly were, to a lesser extent, uh, fattened in a way which was uh, commercially unsatisfactory for the body. Sort of a gagging clause on goats in that context. Whales. Um, certainly, uh, we, we, well, I think we all know that whales use um, infrasound to communicate and uh, infrasound to uh, um, navigate as well, which is perhaps a little less well known. And uh, we, we have found that since uh, a large number of offshore wind farms, have been operating um, on the coast of the North Sea, um, that there have been that there has been a, a significant increase in in whale groundings, and uh, in many incidents when uh, you know baleen whales, you know, enormous, and uh, uh, what's the other ones, the uh, sharks, I think whales, I remember. But uh, anyway, lots of whales um, losing their ability to navigate. And bats, of course, it's in a rather different way, are affected um, by what is usually called the turbulence um, behind the turbine blades. I mean, the reason that bats like the tops of turbines is not because all of them, I mean, many of them can't fly that high, but some bats like noxials can fly that high, and because of the heat generated by the nacelle, the insects congregate there. And now I come from the Isle of Wight, and pestis make turbine bits on the other way. So I have good contacts there, and they, they're in some ways quite respectable company, and they do quite good research. And uh, it, it, let's say I believe that uh, the problem with bats is clearly that we know that the lungs implode or explode due to the pressure change um, 
the Allen, particularly the turbine blades, and uh, the reason that uh, there are a disproportionately large number of bats that suffer turbine death through a lung explosion um, is because they're attracted to their food, which is the insects. Is that, it's, again, it's anecdotal because it's just been reported by lots of the residents, but um, if they're going to have a bad night, the dogs start whimpering, and that's the only thing that tells them they're going to have a bad night. And so that is as the wind shear increases as you're coming into the, um, uh, you know, the early evening, um, the, um, the problems arise, and uh, the dogs whimper, they said, about 10, 15 minutes before they know it's going to be a bit unpleasant for them, for the people, that is. And this wind farm was switched on, and uh, not quite immediately, but very quickly. He saw the milk yield of his cows drop um, by 50%, and uh, that's obviously uneconomic and pretty rough on the cows as well. And um, what he said was that he could get the cows to go to the trough, but they wouldn't drink, they weren't drinking. Um, and obviously, in that case, the milk yield goes down. He had other problems as well, but um, purely because of the financial problem it created, and he is now an arable farmer. And it's important, and extremely important, all these animal cases, all these anecdotes, is the very simple reason that the wind industry now are taking the view that the reason why people complain about wind farm, wind turbine noise, is not because the noise is accompanied by infrasound. Of course it's not, there's no infrasound. Dr. Leventhal tells us that. The reason is that they are, I'm afraid, you're all a psychosomatically weak lot, and you don't like the look of them, or you've got the wrong attitude to climate change, or whatever, but you don't like wind turbines, and that psychosomatically translates to thinking that the noise is more annoying than it really is. I don't suppose a lot of you knew that. The Semyon MM92 is um, a very popular turbine in the UK and I think elsewhere. And uh, I suppose it's comparable with the best of And uh, that is the um, the manufacturer's graph of its noise spectrum. But um, what is really very interesting about it is that it goes down to one hertz. And when I say it's a manufacturer's graph, I have embellished it somewhat, I've added to it. Um, the first thing I've done is to join up two graphs. The, uh, <coughs> the developer actually asked the um, wind test, who are a highly respected and highly reliable um, specialist in measuring wind turbine noise. You know, they erect a turbine and measure the noise that comes from it and do it properly. Now, um, they very unusually, the usual measurements are made from um, 20 hertz upwards, 20 hertz to 8 kilohertz to be exact. Um, and uh, unusually, they were asked to do measurements from 1 to 20 hertz as well. And I've just joined the two graphs up. That's all I've done there. So the blue one and the both parts both of are it is straight from the manufacturer's figures. Um, but manufacturers use A weighting, and uh, in a sense, so they should, because it's in all the standards that they work to in the planning guidance in every country that I'm aware of. Um, so they are entitled to use A weighted. Um, but if you don't use A weighted and you go to Unweighted. Does anyone know what weighting means besides uh, those of you? Uh, yeah, well, we know you and you, you will. <laughs> okay, well, weighting is, uh, uh, I don't know what a weighting curve, but um, it's a way of replicating uh, um, the fact that human hearing sort of peaks between one and four kilohertz. Um, and uh, when you consider that the you know, middle seat on the piano is only about a quarter of a kilohertz, you know, it's a fairly high pitch. Um, and uh, that's fine, but turbines tend to have most of their noise, um, not A-weighted noise, that's low, you need worry about that. What you can't see, can't hear you. And uh, if you look at the unweighted curve there, 
Um, that's quite an interesting one because it goes up to some astonishingly high levels of one hertz, and it looks as if it's on the way up still. So that is of interest. Now, the other thing is that um, I've plotted as a separate curve, and exactly the, it's exactly the same as that, it's the same curve here, except that that is plotted in dBs. And if you're, if you're plotting in dBs, that makes sense if you're thinking about the human ear. But I'm not, I'm thinking about the human body and the animal bodies. So I plotted it in watts. Now, dBs are a logarithmic measure of the wind pressure. Oh, sorry, not the wind pressure, the sound pressure. They're a logarithmic measure, and that means um, those who don't know what dBs are, even now with a very short explanation, those who don't want to know, not their ears, a dB, a dB is a multiplier rather than an addition. If you're counting normally, you just have one every time. Well, I'm going to stop talking about decibels and talk about bells. And a decibel, obviously, is, hot, is a tenth of a bell, okay? And a bell is just a factor of ten. And uh, this is calibrated in bells. Look, it's, it's um, no bells. One, two, three, four, etc. That's in bells. So every one of these lines is a factor of ten apart. Um, and that means that I should be saying not one, ten, twenty, but one, ten, a hundred, a thousand. So when you're measuring in decibels, um, what you're doing is sort of squashing the graph right up at the top. And that's logarithmic counting, not relevant for the ear. What the, the, when you're getting the damage that I've talked about, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of energy involved. So let's plot the energy instead. Let's plot it on a linear scale. And um, what we find is we've got this curve here, where practically all the energy from the turbine is less than 20 hertz, which is the definition of infrasound. Now, I have actually got an A-weighting curve. Um, as I said, uh, A-weighting rules for wind turbine noise measurements and for wind turbine noise limits. Um, I, I say it shouldn't because it was designed to replicate variation in the sensitivity of the human ear. Now, the C weighting which we've also got there is a little better in that it was um, designed to replicate the uh, response of the human ear to quite loud noises. And um, the A weighting, in fact, was for uh, you know, pretty quiet noises, like listening to quiet music or something. And it was um, the BBC that uh, were very much involved with A weighting. And they did, well, they did have some involvement in a way with wind um, G weighting is uh, a, weight, a weighting which I've never understood the need for, um, but the wind energy has started to use it a little bit because of the embarrassment of uh, um, infrasound, which doesn't exist, um, and with uh, very low frequency sound. Um, and you, you can see that the, the problem um, with, you saw the energy going up um, as we went down to, uh, as, as we went down uh, on the previous graph, you know, and uh, what you see here is that yes, um, it does peak this particular weighting curve, so it exaggerates, um, if you like, a, a little bit even the noise level um, up at tw uh, 20 hertz, um, which it does do, but it drops like a stone even faster than G weighting up below that. And so by the time you get down to uh, 1 hertz, which is the frequency that matters, and then you're waiting it and pretending that it's not a problem. And we should not be using the, the variable sensitivity of the human ear, ear um, when we're considering huge amounts of energy and infrasound frequencies. And um, the, uh, the maximum sensitivity, which is around a kilohertz of the human ear, the gap, the difference between the threshold of pain and the threshold of hearing is um, it's sort of one followed by about 14 zeros. It might be 13, but it's a lot of zeros. Um, and what that should tell you is that you know, it's an enormous range. Now, what the ear has got inside it is the, uh, 
the middle ear have got the, uh, the, the uh, stapes and the stapes muscle and the three ossicles in the middle ear. And uh, they're very cleverly designed to absorb um, very high sound volumes at normal audio frequencies. It's called wind shear, and it's the fact that the wind speed, the wind speed increases as you rise up from the ground. And what that tells you is that the wind speed at the top of the turbine is going to be much higher um, by that to that distance. Um, it's going to be much higher than the wind speed at the bottom. And uh, if you sort of push the turbine into the ground a bit more so that you don't spoil the view so much, you obviously increase that difference because they, you're then moving down to a point here and here or whatever. So uh, the consequence of that is that uh, changing the visibility of the turbine to benefit um, the wind farm neighbour um, unfortunately increases the wind shear, and that matters a lot. And that brings me to the subject of amplitude modulation, um, which is not a problem at all, um, except that I didn't know how to operate this thing. And let's try the page up. Yes. Um, I'm not sure you want. Um, the, this curve here, and that's uh, thanks to Mike Stickwood of MAS, um, it is infrasound. I mean, so it's, it's an amplitude modulation, um, and uh, it's real, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a modulation depth here. I prefer to call it height because when, you, when EAN comes in, it doesn't uh, sort of wobble around the level as it was it actually increases the height. You know, you haven't got a symmetric waveform here. The tendency, especially if you look at that bit, is the higher modulation and it goes up. The trough doesn't descend, the peak goes up, and which is a clue that it's not really modulation at all. Um, that's just the background noise and it is not terribly relevant to, to what we're talking about. So um, I go on to the next slide, which is from NASA, and it's uh, a very simple explanation of why turbine blades get noisier when the angle of attack increases. And when the angle of attack <coughs> is, um, when, when you're just sort of, uh, I think in terms of aeroplanes, uh, when you're just uh, flying horizontally and smoothly, you've got very little angle, angle of attack, or not nothing else, you'll gradually descend, but maybe a few degrees. And you get a little bit of turbulence noise from the from the wing, from the trailing edge of the wing. Um, when you're climbing hard, then you get um, quite a lot more noise because the um, the flow detaches here, and there's the all turbulence, which is really just noise. Not a lot of difference between turbulence and noise. <coughs> This is losing the drive is extremely important to the generation of infrasound because um, what you get is um, first of all we've got to establish we've got to establish that the if I think it down there tell me please um, you've got to establish that the these blades they're actually Siemens blades are very flexible now that's a photograph taken on the key side waiting for export and you can see that um, they're quite sort of bendy things even when they're lying flat. <coughs> <coughs> the extent to which they're elastic is shown by the fact that in test, this is a triple exposure, okay, and uh, there's three, there's the rest position and bend, bend a lot and bend even more. Now that's one heck of a bend. Um, I, mean, I, can't put, uh, I can't put a figure on it, but it looks um, quite bendy to me and uh, they're made of um, fiberglass compromise. Red, fiberglass resins and largely, and they're very flexible and very elastic.
Yeah, that one won't work either now. He said, well, it might, I'll try it. I said, oh, yes. Um, the other thing you get is vortex shedding, and uh, this is a um, lamppost vortex shedding, but it's a very good video of it. And uh, obviously they're much smaller than wind turbines, and they haven't got in the cell at the top. And um, when this happens with wind turbines, the oscillation is like this. And uh, the important four conclusions that I've come to. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we've got to get it established and accepted that um, it, it's the power and the energy that's uh, actually coming out somehow or other acoustically. Um, and uh, the matters, it's not the audible noise at all. This what you can't see. What you can't hear and um, can't harm you is about as sensible as someone to put on a pair of sunglasses and let go of nude sunbathing. You wouldn't do it. Why has the wind industry not measured infrasound levels down to 0.2 hertz, which is what we are going to be doing, um, to prove that they're right and prove that we are wrong? Um, I don't think they've reported any. They may have made some. I don't know. But I don't think I've seen any. Well, I know I haven't seen any reported measurements that go below the one that so we saw on the earlier slide. The the slide with the uh, different coloured lines on. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Extremely lucid. Very interesting. Uh, Infrasound because it's below uh, the hearing threshold and A weighting because it's audible sound, but as you've heard, um, it, low frequency sound, very low frequency infrasound is high energy, and it doesn't matter if it goes through the ear or not, it does get there, it gets to the brain. Um, something else to say which is very important from an epidemiological point of view, those pigs and those geese, they show what tends to be convincing in epidemiological method, and that is a dose-response relationship. So, the more the sound, the greater the effect. The nearer the, the geese and the pigs were to the turbines, the greater effect. The further away, the less effect. These are all important things. And they're one of the multiple strands in which you ascribe causality. You may not be able to do it, and it is difficult to ascribe causality unless you can perform the experiment that you want to, and sometimes the experiments you'd like to do are impossible to do or they're ethically impossible to do. So remember those important things. I remember a nice little cutlet about the girls. Little girl, box of paints, lick the brush among the saints. So it's a dangerous thing to do. Our speaker, next speaker is Ariana. Uh, highly distinguished BSc in Physics, State University of New York. MSc in Environmental Engineering, um, PhD in Environmental Science, University, University of Lisbon, and working with a multidisciplinary research team investing in biological response to infrasound and low frequency noise for the guts of 30 years. Uh, it's been the team's assistance quarter since almost 20 years, uh, sitting with three scientific awards and so on. May I say any more? Uh, no. Thank you. Um, I, I should thank, first of all, the people that brought me here, specifically Ms. Andrew Stewart and also um, Professor Alan M. Evans, Alan Evans. So I will get on this right away because I hear you're very hot back there somehow. Um, so I'm, as Professor Allen said, We've been at this for 30 years, not wind turbines. Wind turbines are just the last of a very long list of sources of infrasound and low frequency noise. So please understand, I have as much against wind turbines as I have against airports and public transportation. So I just wanted to, see, to let you know where I'm coming from. This is my uh, uh, talk usually requires a disclaimer. I'm sure you'll understand why. And again, as I say, wind turbines are the last 
of a very long list of sources of infrasound and low frequency noise, not least of which are the military, of course. And we have a lot of military personnel who are exposed to low frequency noise and infrasound, and that is bad for them. So, I like to start off with radiation because I don't know who I have in the audience. And everybody knows that we don't see x-rays, right? We all know this. But we also know that if we get too much exposure to x-rays, then we get sick, right? We know this, right? But it's okay if we get like a chest x-ray per year. That's not gonna make us sick. So everybody kind of knows this with radiation. We all know that there's a certain part of radiation that we can actually perceive with our eyes. And everything else, we cannot perceive with our eyes. And another thing about radiation that we sort of know is that radiation comes in waves. Acoustic sound waves are also waves. And that's why I'm starting with radiation. I want you all to understand what it means a high frequency or a low frequency. What they do, what it means when they say that. Here's a wave. You see the distance here between these two peaks? Compare it with the distance with these two peaks. Of course, this distance is larger than that distance. This one has a larger wavelength. This is called the length of the wave. This one has a smaller wavelength. In any wave, light, sound, ocean waves, any wave, the higher the frequency, the smaller the distance of the wavelength. Conversely, the lower the frequency, the larger the distance of the wavelength. So this is true for radiation, it's true for sound. So if I'm gonna be talking about frequency, I need you guys to know what we're all talking about. And what is this shenanigans about the DBA and the DBC? You won't get it if you don't understand this. Low frequency has an enormous wavelength in between peaks. So let's move right along into acoustics. That's why we're all here, right? So what you saw before was how we saw in which part of radiation that we see. Some is x-ray, some is AM radio. This is the spectrum of acoustics. So it's very rudimentarily, rudimentarily segmented. All we have are audible, and then ultrasound, which is not audible, and infrasound, which is not audible. So basically, if this were radiation, we would be segmenting the whole thing as visible and non-visible. We don't do that. We have x-rays and infrared and cosmic rays and gamma rays and FM radio and AM radio. We have all these little segmentations for radiation, not so for acoustics. And that's a huge problem because all of a sudden we're putting everything in the same bag. Imagine if we put x-rays and UVs all in the same bag. Would we actually know what causes which pathology? We wouldn't. It's all in the same bag. That's what we're doing with acoustics. What happens with acoustics and the low frequency, so where the distance between the, wave, the, the peaks is large, is that these waves can actually penetrate structures. Compare. At 3,000 hertz, this is very audible to us, the human baby cries at 3,500 hertz. That is where we are most sensitive. It should certainly makes sense, right? If we don't hear our babies cry, we're not gonna survive as a species. So we're really, really sensitive at 3,500 hertz where the baby cries. Look, the wavelength is what, 11 centimeters. Compare this with 20 hertz. That's our threshold. That's what usually we say those are the limits of our hearing. It's 20 hertz. That wavelength is 17 meters. Why is this relevant? Rule of thumb, you want to protect a structure against a wavelength. Rule of thumb, the thickness of the barrier has to be the order of greatness as the wavelength. So if I want to protect this room against 20 hertz, I should build a 17 meter thick wall around this room. Isn't that wonderful? That's why low frequency noise is a huge problem. We have no idea how to stop it from penetrating homes and structures and the workplaces as well. This is what an acoustic wave sort of looks like. It hits us like this. Okay. The World Health, Health Organization
organization classifies noise as an inanimate mechanical force. So when you are in a noise environment, let's say we all go to a disco club or something, well then our whole entire body is as if it were receiving little punches all over, little punches all over. Sometimes it's big punches, right? Because those uh, discos can have really significantly wonderful infrasound low frequency noise systems, right? That's what we go there for. Do, do, do. That's what we like, right? When we are there, it's as if, in terms of physics, you're getting impacted by this mechanical force that flies through the air and impacts your body. That is what is happening when you are in any acoustical environment. But, like the x-ray, if I go to a club once a year, it's not going to be harmful. If I work there, it might be. Like the x-rays, one chest x-ray a year won't harm you. One a day might be problematic. Acoustic waves, or any waves, are also defined by amplitude. This is the amount of energy that a wave can have. Of course, lower amplitude has lower energy than higher amplitude waves. And science decided to measure amplitude of acoustic waves in the now famous decibel. Where the heck does this decibel come from? 1920, Harvey Fletcher. He was a very important acoustician related to telephones. He was uh, hired by the, what, what then became the first uh, Bell Laboratories, today at and and other things. Um, he studied, you see, when the telephone came out, it was very important to have speech intelligibility be perfect. It was, it was important to have somebody that somehow you could listen and you hear all the speech and somebody talks into something and the other person hears all the speech. Who cares about infrasound and low frequency noise? We don't speak, we're not elephants or whales. We don't speak in infrasound and low frequency noise. So Harvey Fletcher had to find out how it is that humans hear and where is it important in terms of frequencies. And that's how we get the fletcher munson equal loudness curves. This is what is the basis for the now infamous DBA, which we'll be talking a bit uh, a bit in a while. So again, in 1920, this man used uh, 23 healthy young males, of course, right? Females, God, how could you possibly? Because we're all hysterics, so if you change all, you could be terrible. And how did he present the sound? By an earpiece stuck into the ear, like the telephone. This is for the telephone. Who cares about infrasound low frequency noise? We want to eliminate it. Nobody hears there. So this is where the DBA and how we measure sound comes from, from over 100 years ago. Here's the frequencies. This is 10, and this goes up to 20,000. This is the amplitude level in dBs. So what I'm showing you here is where we speak is this area. This goes approximately from 100 hertz to about 10,000 hertz. This, this region is what we want to protect. This region, if we get too much noise in that region, we go deaf. We can't understand people, people speaking. There is no speech intelligibility. So when we started protecting people against noise exposure, we focused here but you can't hear, won't hurt you. This is how it was in 1932 when they actually started with these little machines and all of this. It was actually quite an interesting uh, history. But again, all the protection of noise has all to do with the ear. Even when you're measuring dose with a dosimeter, the correct location for the machine is right next to your shoulder because it's near your ear. So it's all very, very biased, if you want, towards the ear. And here comes the DBA. So, remember, 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz, this is where we hear very well. This is where we want to protect hearing. What does this curve mean? Let's take 1,000 hertz. Let's look over there. Zero. This means, with a DBA, 
at 1,000 hertz, what you are actually measuring is actually what is there in the environment. The number that the machine spits out actually corresponds to the dB level, the amplitude that is actually present in the environment. But the difference between what you're measuring and what is present is zero. Let's go to 10 hertz. At 10 hertz, look at the dBA, what you're actually measuring is 70 dBs lower than what's actually in the environment. 70. All right, let's take a thermometer, okay? Let me say that I have a thermometer and that if you go above 37 degrees Celsius in your body temperature, your thermometer is going to give you a 50 degrees Celsius error. How good would that thermometer be? Or the other way around. Imagine you went from 36, imagine you were in the cold somewhere and you were 36 degrees uh, Celsius in your body temperature and then anything below 36 would actually give you an error of 50 degrees Celsius. How great a thermometer would that be, huh? So whoever is telling you, oh yes, it's wonderful to measure infrasound and low frequency noise with the DBA, oh yeah? You get a 70 dB error when you're using DBAs at 10 hertz. So, obviously this is not a good way to measure, to quantify infrasound and low frequency noise. And let me just say, what usually people are told in order to justify the use of the DBA is, what you can't hear won't hurt you, right? So it doesn't even matter what's down here because you're not gonna hear it, and if you're not gonna hear it, it's not gonna hurt you. Like x-rays, right? You don't see them, so they won't hurt you. Or UVs, right? <laughs> okay, other metrics as John showed. We have the DBA, which is in blue, the DBB, the DBC, the DBD, and now we have the DBG. Look, our team measures with no weighting. What it means is it's just dBs straight on. What does that mean in terms of our microphones is that all the way down to at least 0.5, we're actually getting more, but at least to 0.5 hertz. What we're measuring is actually what's there all along, at least linearly, at least until a thousand straight on. <laughs> what we're measuring is what's there. Don't give me what we would hear if we were there or other things. This is not relevant for what? We are trying to quantify an agent of disease. Quantify how much is there, not any A's and B's and G's, I want to know how much is there, period. As a physicist, I want to know how much is there, don't give me 70 dB error? What is that? What am I measuring? Nothing. So, our group has, for many years now, measured without anything. It's called linear. When you measure sound without any weighting, it's called dB linear as opposed to dBA. I'm going to show you examples and you'll be fully ready to go out there and complain about the DBA. These are measurements taken in the cockpit of an aircraft, in a stopped commuter train outside of Lisbon, and in the car, my car. <coughs> my car, my Fiat Punto, when it was new. So, as you can see, the cockpit VBA 72.1, the train 71.4, the car 71.2. In science, or in, in the uh, sciences out there, they would consider this acoustically equivalent environments. Same VBA, more or less one, same VBA, so Theoretically, if I put a rat in the cockpit and a rat in the stop train and a rat in the car, they'll all develop the same problems within the same amount of time. Really? Really? The black bars are the cockpit. The blue bars are the stopped train. The DBAs in both are very similar as we saw, 72.1 and 71.4. This is what we would hear if we were in these environments. But this 
is what we are actually exposed to in terms of acoustical energy. In the cockpit, we would hear 72, but we are exposed to 83 in terms of energy. In the train, we, are, we would hear 71, so almost the same as the cockpit, but we are exposed whole body to 92. So, what happens in the car? My car, my little Fiat Punto, has 100 dB linears at 120 kilometers an hour, alone on a highway at 3 o'clock in the morning, no cars or trains or things going by, and the windows closed and obviously the radio is off. Okay, so pure 120 kilometers per hour. This is what I am exposed to in my little Fiat Punto. And that is what I'm exposed to in the cockpit, but we're going to hear the same. What you're going to perceive through your ear will be the same. Your whole body exposure will, will be different, though. Okay, now I hope this works. Oh, it's working. I love this. <laughs> I love this because it really shows how an acoustic environment behaves. This is your DBA. It will never go over 40, ever. And now look at what is actually occurring with the acoustical energy that this <coughs> DBA claims to characterize. Baloney. Have you seen? This is what, what is it? 43 dBA, is that what they're asking you for wind turbines, really? Well, this one never goes over 40. So is this, what, is, this, is this what they're asking for? Are you telling me that this has absolutely no effect? Oh, we can't hear it, right, so it's no problem. Baloney. No? Ah, the mink farm. The mink farm. John's horrible dead mink farm. Oh yes, we were there, and uh, we met with the owner and his, his lovely family, none of whom live in this home anymore, of course. That's happening to the mink. Imagine what's happening to the humans. So um, we now have a new equipment with which we're measuring noise. I shouldn't say measuring noise. We are quantifying your sound and low frequency noise. This is the home. He's got four wind turbines, three uh, megawatts, total height 150, so total width of blade. I refrain from uh, giving out the model and make of the wind turbines. Uh, I, I'm sure you will understand why. I'm a scientist. I don't care if it's Siemens, if it's Vestas, if it's McDonald's. I don't care. It's, there are technical specifications associated with machines, and in our belief, that's what we should stick to. This is not a vendetta or a war against Siemens or Vestas or McDonald's, you know. So uh, we refrain, we have the information, of course, but we refrain from publicly because this is not against any particular company. So location one, so this is the home, this is where location one is, and this is where location two of the sheds. Location one has an older type shed, location two has a newer type shed, and they're actually uh, different in size. So we measured there with our new wonderful equipment and by chance we actually got no rotation of the wind turbines. This is videotaped. So I've got video footage of the wind turbines stopped. Not because anybody decided to appease, you know, appease us and stop them. There was just no wind that day. And we have them a few days later, so about two weeks later, we have them rotating. In red, this is DBA. This is what they're telling you to measure, right? This is all that matters to legislation, whether it's wind turbines, whether it's occupational. This is not, a, this is generalized uh, in acoustics, in the world of acoustics. And look, this is the noise or the acoustic energy that is present. And this is the acoustic energy that becomes present when they're rotating. This is the linear. So this is what's actually there. And this is what you're hearing. This is what's actually there. And this is what you're hearing. That was location one. This is location two. So obviously, when you have an onslaught, a pressure wave, 
impacting a structure. The type of structure will make a difference in terms of the noise that you get inside. We all know this. We all know this. How many stores have you been in that are on ground level on top of a very uh, busy road in terms of traffic? And you're in the store and you feel the traffic. We all know this. And if it's a larger store or a longer store, you feel it differently. We all know this. If you pay attention to your surroundings, your normal surroundings, you will experience this once again. This is what the DBA is measuring. All that is in red is what the DBA measures. And what is there is actually the gray stuff, DB linear. That's without wind turbines, and that's with wind turbines. So I think it's very clear that even though what you hear may differ a little, the actual acoustical energy that's present when wind turbines are rotating is significantly different. So these are our new pictures. This is what we call a sonogram. So here we see, this is no wind turbines. Here we see, and these are frequencies. It goes until 160 hertz down to 0.25. I think it's said here, 0.25. It probably goes down to 0.1. What is this? This is constant. This is time. Time goes on. This is a constant sound. When no rotation of wind turbines is present, this has to do with the watering system of the mix. When we are there actually measuring, you hear water in the background, and you hear water, the water systems that actually feed the mink in the background. And this is with the rotating wind turbines. As you can see, here there is not so much acoustical energy, and here it becomes more obvious. You don't get this with DBAs. You don't get this information with DBAs. So in terms of public health, with this sort of information, oh, I can now start to think about those responses because you know what? I'm actually quantifying the agent of disease. This is great. More dramatic is location two. Without wind turbines and with wind turbines. I'll tell you something. The owner of this mink farm prefers to keep his animals not in location two, prefers to keep his animals in location one. Oh, that's impossible. There's more noise in location one, more noise at certain frequencies. Our body does not respond the same to all frequencies. Our lungs will respond to one frequency, our stomach will respond to another frequency, our eyes will respond to another frequency. And it depends on the body, on the animal, on the type of tissue, what type of frequency is going to be worse in terms of health. So, I think we've sort of done the acoustics part of it. So, what our team, much to the chagrin of many groups, has been studying over the past 30 years is the pathology that develops when you are excessively exposed to infrasound and low-frequency noise. Again, we started way back when, and our latest presentation was actually a few weeks ago at uh, Zurich in the International Conference of uh, Biological Effects of Noise. How did this all start, and why are we calling it vibroacoustic disease, and why is it so unpopular? So now we go to a little history lesson. You know, I'm trying to scrunch up 30 years of research into 40 minutes, so bear with me. 1980, Portuguese Air Force plant, it's an aeronautical plant. They do uh, re rebuilding and, ma and maintenance of aircraft, military aircraft. They had contracts with the US Navy, the US Air Force, among other uh, European, um, and other European um, air forces. So, Dr. Castello Branco, who was the principal investigator of this project, became chief medical officer of this location in 1979, just at the end of it. He decided, as a good physician should, he went to visit every workplace of these workers to see, as a medical officer in charge of the well-being of these workers, what he would have to worry about. During uh, a run-up procedure, since I don't think we all have planes, a run-up procedure is after you have maintenance on an aircraft, 
you put the aircraft on the tarmac, on, on, on the landing strip, and you run every ancient regime, you run it, while quality control personnel are around the aircraft checking. Of course, they have the auditory protecting, right? The, the, those Mickey Mouse ears, of course, they're protecting the hearing. But they are in person going around, and some of these are jet engines, so we're talking military aircraft, we're not talking about the benign commercial aircraft. What he sees at one point is a man, a worker, who starts walking without purpose, and medicine is called an automatism, and so he starts walking without purpose, he's going to the exhaust of the jets, and a colleague grabs him, and the situation dies there. At the end of the run-up procedure, Dr. Branca goes and speaks to the guy who grabbed him. Hey, what happened over there? You have to grab your colleague. Oh, yes, sometimes that happens. It's terrible. You know what? Back in the 60s, there was a guy, we didn't grab him in time, and he actually died. This is not what your chief medical officer wants to hear from their employees. So the automatism to this Dr. Gisela Branco was reminiscent of an epileptic nature, something of an epileptic nature. So he went back to the medical records of every personnel, and he found that 10% of these aircraft technicians had been already diagnosed with late onset epilepsy. The expected rate for the Portuguese population is 0.2. Certainly a problem. And so, between 80 and 86, a lot of neurological tests were run on these men. Many um, indeed revealed problems, uh, evoked potentials. I'm not going to get into this, all this medical jargon with you, but they, these medical or neurologically, uh, te neurological tests revealed problems in these people, not normal problems for their age group. So in 1983, one of the technicians died. Dr. Castello Branco is a pathologist. He wants to do an autopsy to see what the heck killed this person. The family became offended. No, no, we cannot open the man up. No, no. And of course, doctor did not insist. But one colleague of this dead person, Mr. Philippe Pedro, I have the authorization of the family to use his name. Mr. Philippe Pedro understood the importance of getting an autopsy. So he went to the notary, and he had a will drawn up demanding upon his death to be autopsied by Dr. Castello Branco. And he gave this note, this notarized will, to the doctor, who of course was, oh please, I mean, this man was much younger than Dr. Castello Branco, and the doctor was like, oh no, please, I'm going to go before you. This is a ridiculous thing. Thank you, I'm very touched, but it's not going to happen. Well, in 1987, September, early morning, Dr. Phil uh, Mr. Philippe Pedro calls Dr. Branco. I'm not feeling good. I'm going, I already called the ambulance. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to die. Meet me there for the autopsy. <laughs> and Dr. Branco, of course, reassured the man, well, you're not going to die. I'm glad you called the ambulance. I'll be here. Don't worry. And when he got there, the man was dead. And the autopsy was performed. Well, to this day, we thank Mr. Philippe Pedro, because had it not been for his autopsy, we would still be studying the brain. And what we found is this, this is a man who is under a, a, a medical research team, and we had no idea he had two tumors, one in the kidney and one in the brain, with apparently no symptoms, no known symptoms of these types of tumors. He died from a heart attack. The 11th heart attack, or actually the 12th. Heart attacks, when you have a heart attack, a little scar is formed in the muscle of your heart. This man had 11 scars. He died in the 12th. 11 silent heart events that this man had. He is under a research team, and we didn't pick it up. This man's EKG, normal. All of them, by the way, EKGs are normal. What we also found, which was extraordinary, is abnormal thickening of cardiovascular structures. So structures that have to do with blood vessels, with the pericardium, which I'll be speaking a bit more about, these all of a sudden were very thickened. 
But there was no <coughs> interference with the heart function because the EKG was normal. At any rate, what we found is that there's no way that this is restricted to the neurological system or the neurological apparatus of the human body. This is your heart. Around your heart, you have a thin sac called the pericardium. It's a sac. Nobody cares about this in medicine. Now, they started caring about it a bit when they started making valve, prosthetic valves for humans out of cow pericardium. Nobody cares about the pericardium. It's just a sac. Chinese medicine, however, dedicates a whole meridian to the pericardium. So, that's something one should think about. A whole meridian on par with the liver, the lung, the heart. Something to think about. Anyway, the normal thickness of this little thing, this very, very thin sheet, is 0 0.5 millimeters. Well, in people exposed to low frequency noise, the thickness of the pericardium can go up to 1.2 millimeters. What you are looking at are actual pictures of pericardium taken from patients who were recommended for cardiac surgery by the national healthcare system. They were asked and they were informed consent if we could take, because you understand, to get to the heart, you have to cut the pericardium that was used to perform surgery. So since that was the case, we asked them if we could have a little piece of tissue, and this was a VA patient, and this was a normal patient who had cardiac disease, but not because of noise exposure, maybe too many McDonald's and all of that, but not low frequency noise exposure. I point out that the scale of these two micrographs are, is the same. So I didn't make this figure so you can see better. This is absolutely the same scale. Now I could talk for about two hours just on this, I won't, but I just wanted to show you this is what we get from humans who are exposed excessively to infrasound and low frequency noise. You don't have to cut a guy up, a guy or a gal, to see if the pericardium is thick and thank the Lord. No, we have something fabulous called echocardiography. It's the ultrasound like you do for the babies, but it's for your heart. And with this simple, non-invasive test, we can see whether or not the pericardium is thickened. And I don't know if there are any uh, medical people here in the audience, but there is no inflammatory process. This has nothing to do with pericarditis. There is no dysfunction of the diastolic. There's no problems with the diastolic function. Nothing to do with pericarditis. And we'll just leave it at that. That was specifically for uh, medical personnel that may be in the house. So, this is where the blood flows. This is a blood vessel. This wall is thickened. It's supposed to be thin, and it's thickened. Here also, this is blood, 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 blood. This is the blood vessel. Look at the thickness of this wall. It's supposed to be very thin. Many of our patients are getting heart attacks, heart conditions, not because this fills up with plaque and cholesterol and all that stuff, no. It's because the wall keeps thickening and thickening and thickening and it cuts off the blood flow and you have coronary problems. But who goes to see why you have a coronary problem? They fix it. The end result is the same. You can have coronary heart disease. The reason of how you get there is entirely different. And this is a problem for public health. We cannot put everybody in the same bag. Oh, you had a heart attack, see, you shouldn't have eaten all those McDonald's. No, maybe it's you shouldn't have lived where you lived with all that noise. So, what is fibroacoustic disease? These are the clinical stages of this disease as defined for occupational exposure. Now, how did this all come about? We didn't just pull this out of our hats. We looked at 306 aircraft technicians. We eliminated and eliminated all those with pre-existing cardiac disease, all those with diabetes, all those with streptococcal infections, all those with excessive alcohol consumption, neuroleptics, everybody. We eliminated them all. Out of 306, we got 140 clean men, all aircraft technicians. 
And we didn't ask them. That wouldn't be good. We didn't ask them, oh, how do you feel? We went, to those 140, we went to their medical files at Alma, at this aeronautical plant, for a worker to make use of the national healthcare system, they must go to the on-site medical center, led by Dr. Costello Branco. The on-site medical center, if they did not have the specialty there, would then send the patient through the national healthcare system into the, you know, whatever specialty was required. So we have all of their medical records. And that's what we counted. For it to be on this list, it means that 70 of the 140, meaning 50% of these people, have this in their medical records again. We didn't go and ask them, how do you feel today? So after one to four years of exposure, 70 of the 140 have bronchitis, whether or not they smoked. And then, oh, oh, by the way, it's not, it's not exclusive, right? So you start to have four to 10 years of exposure, and you stop having this, and you start having that, no luck. <laughs> On top of this, you get that. So out of these 140, 70 were complaining of blood and urine. That's what like uh, boxers get, right? So after 10 years, at least 70 had decreased vision, severe joint pain, on top of the inflammation, of the viral skin infections, of the ingestion. So if you're a man, and you go to a doctor, and you complain of all these things, <coughs> the doctor might give you the benefit of the doubt, and actually give you the normal run-of-the-mill tests that will reveal nothing. At that point, the doctor will probably say, well, it's probably what, what psychosomatic? Is that, is that the next step? Or, oh, he just wants sick leave. He's a malinger. He just wants to go home on vacation a little bit. That's if you're a man. You're a woman. Complaining of all of this? Oh, come on, you're hysterical. You're hysterical. You need to go and get something because it will solve everything. So this is actually, you're laughing, but I was actually in Dublin. In Dublin, with an Irish case that we had here because of the uh, Dublin bus company, the woman who actually had diagnostic medical tests showing her pathology was accused of being a hysteric because her six kids had left the house already and she had nothing else to do but go on the internet and invent diseases. So I'm not, I'm not pulling this out of my hat. This is all very much based in experience. <coughs> Respiratory pathology was very unusual. I don't know if you remember, we saw in, uh, during the autopsy the guy had, uh, clear, had a pulmonary fibrosis. So all of these, many of these patients were complaining of bronchitis, repeated throat infections, they had hoarseness for no apparent reason, and unexplained cases of pleural effusion. These unexplained cases of pleural effusion were actually quite atypical. They did not respond to the usual therapeutics, and the men, what, they took a long, long time to actually recover. This is not what is expected of pleural diffusion. And so you put rats in noise, Wistar rats, which is what is usually used in science, and this was the type of noise that, the noise environment that they were exposed to. I must point out that in 1992, there really wasn't a lot of equipment. There's still not a lot of equipment today to go beyond the 20. So the reason why you're only seeing it down to 20 here, that's the equipment we had at the time. So, and this uh, type of environment was chosen because we were trying to simulate the workers of helicopters. Workers of helicopters seem to be worse off a little bit than workers of fixed wing aircraft, but that was why we chose this environment. Ah, and we exposed the rats to eight hours a day, five days a week, weekends in science. Occupational exposure, right? So, we found thickening again. This time, the alveolar walls were thickened. Again, notice the, the scale of these pictures is exactly the same. I did not make this one bigger. 
It's exactly the same. And the alveoli is in your lungs. It's where the exchange of oxygen and CO2 occurs. So in the rats, and the rats aren't smoking, the rats aren't exposed to chemicals, you know, it's just noise. And again, we see thickening. We decided also to study the trachea. So the next picture you're going to see is the trachea. I'm going to need your help soon because I'm going to need you to help. Oh, rat. Not this old. The airflow passes over this surface. That's the normal one. This is after 2,213 hours of occupational exposure to low frequency noise. As you can see, it looks like a moonscape as opposed to an underwater state. Now, this cell is called the brush cell for obvious reasons, and it also exists on the trachea. These things, these little things, they're made of something called actin. Actin is just a building block of stuff in our body, and ours and other mammals, and even plants. So what happens to this brush cell as a noise exposure commences? As you can see, it starts getting fused. They start to clump up. After more hours of exposure, you have this, what used to be a brush cell. And after 5,000 plus hours of exposure, this is a dead cell. It's not functional anymore. This is in the respiratory tract, the trachea, of rats exposed to noise, not smoking, etc. We also, of course, studied the ear. Of course. Do you know these little hair cells are actually made of actin? This is the same substance as that stuff in the brush cell. So this is a normal ear. What you're seeing, okay, um, could you please just, because I, I need to. No, you can sit. Okay. okay, so here's your ear, here's that membrane. Those hair cells are on top of here. And on top, you have a tectorial membrane. To get this picture, we cut the tectorial membrane off and we photographed it. What happens when satin comes through? The basal membrane, this part, is going to start, sorry, it's going to start moving. As it moves, the little hair cells connect with the tectorial membrane where the rest of the nervous system and then it goes to the brain. Thank you. So, as you can see, you can individually count these little tufts of hair cells. Here it's missing, and there it's missing. This is the normal aging process. We all lose hair cells as we age, mammals. <coughs> and this is what happens when you're exposed to noise. Now, this is the tectorial membrane that was easy for us to cut off in the control rats. Look, they're fused. They're absolutely fused with the top. We had to serrate it off, like saw it off, to get the picture like the one in the control. Not only are they fused among themselves, they're fused with the top, and there's none of them missing. They're all there. No more uh, aging process, uh, losing uh, uh, hair cells. So our group has postulated that this is the organic reason for why mammals feel annoyance. Why do I say mammals and not just uh, humans? When you have a group of star rats and you make the sound of a blown kiss, they don't like it, the normal ones. They're like, ooh, what is that? And they get all tense and they really don't like the sound. When you get the low frequency noise exposed rats and you make this blown kiss sound, they rise on their hind legs, they shake, and they fall backwards. So, psychosomatic, nocebo, yeah, right. With humans, it's an entirely different behavior if you are exposed to excessive noise that is making you deaf, or exposed to excessive infrasound low frequency noise. The most common difference is the person who is exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise gets home and turns the TV down because they can't stand it. The hearing, the deaf guy, right? What? Say it more. Let me turn this up high. I can't hear. This is not the behavior of people exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise. They cuddle away. They
They don't want noise. They isolate themselves. Forget restaurants, forget cafes, forget boning. Forget the movies, for God's sakes. Cars, if you must. This is a very significant difference, behavioral difference, between people who get deaf and people who are exposed to sound low frequency noise. As a scientist, I cannot avoid putting two, two slides of cell biology. Guys, we have to understand why this is happening to our body. And if you think that this is the cell, is that what they taught you? This is the cell is not a balloon with floating things inside. I know that's what they teach you, but it's not. This is a cell. It is all interconnected, all interconnected. There's no movement that is not transmitted to the next cell over, or at least to the part that's in between the cells. That is what a cell is. And from the Ingber laboratory at Harvard University, they have actually modeled what happens to cells when they are what? Exposed to inanimate mechanical forces. This is what happens to cells. I know, I, this is not ours. This is from Harvard University. This man has been the, fighting this for 30 years, explaining how tensegrity structures, and that's an architectural term, but how tensegrity structures actually explain mechanical cellular signaling. It's not only biochemical, it's also mechanical signaling, and that's why we have <coughs> problems. Occupational versus environmental, so what is the difference? Yes. In environmental exposure, so people in their residences, what we have found is that, of course, the levels are much lower than you're next to a jet engine. Obviously, they're much lower. However, it's not eight hours a day, five days a week, because it's in silence, is it? It's non-stop, it can be non-stop, continuous, particularly when you're sleeping. When you are sleeping, cells do things that they don't do and cannot do when they're awake. So if you're exposing your whole entire body to massive punching while your cells, while you're sleeping and your cells are trying to do certain things, you can have a problem. One of the most common uh, complaints of our patients is, I wake up tired. I wake up tired. That should say a lot. It's not I wake up a lot during the night. They might even sleep the night, but they wake up tired. A common, common complaint in people exposed to low-frequency noise. This was one of our first documented cases of uh, residential infrasound and low-frequency noise. This is the view from the veranda, and that monster thing is this monster thing. So this was um, actually a very interesting case. We published it in 2004. We actually had a 10-year-old involved, and that echocardiogram, that thing with the heart, actually showed significant damage to this 10-year-old. Why? Levels are not so high. The white is the cockpit. The black is what's found in the house. But the mother spent the entire pregnancy in that home. Moreover, in the beginning, there was not the EU directive demanding that this be shut down at night. So while the woman was pregnant with this now 10-year-old, noise was ongoing all the time. That makes a difference, as we saw also in our rats. And finally, <laughs> what we're all here for, the wind turbines. This is our wind turbine case in Portugal. It started in 07, and it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court. In 2013, the Supreme Court decided that these four wind turbines had to be taken down, and they were. What is the problem? This was the noise measured in the house when the four wind turbines were still in existence. So it was in 07. I did not measure this noise. An accredited firm of acousticians measured this noise and gave us the report, and we analyzed the data, just so things don't get muddled up. So, this is what is the red, is supposed, it shows what the levels that are there when the wind turbines are not rotating, and the black and the gray bars show uh, what is there when they are rotating at night and in the daytime. This goes down to 6.3, and it goes up to 500 hertz. So clearly, uh, rotation of wind turbines uh, increased the infrasound and low frequency of noise in the master bedroom, oh yes? Are they measuring noise around your home outside? <laughs> really? Is that where you sleep? Outside? Do you know that when an onslaught of airborne pressure hits your house, 
is going to create resonance phenomenon. And outside doesn't cut it. You're not sleeping outside. So, what happened with this case? This is an example. In 2010, this is a bullfighter who uh, raises thoroughbred Lusitanian horses for bullfights. And his horses started, do we have horse people here? They started developing what is called boxy feet. Now, it didn't matter if the foal was born on the farm or was brought in from elsewhere when he was young. They would develop this called flexural limb deformity. And there's a surgery that you can do to correct this, which is what some of these horses uh, were submitted to. And they're doing fairly fine, although the man has already removed them from their original stables. They're not near in their stables anymore. They're in another part of the farm, and that has helped. Legally, so while the, while the case was ongoing regarding these four, guess what started getting put up anyway, while the case was ongoing. So this man, effectively, he won the battle and lost the war. They took out four, but now he's got a whole bunch of them more, which are not part of the court case, right? The court case was only those four. Yeah, so finally, and this is my almost last slide, limb deformities. This is what we find in our rats exposed to low frequency noise. This is what I found just recently in Australia in a home exposed to sound low frequency noise due to coal mining activities. See, it's not all wind turbines, guys. Coal mining activities. And this is wind turbines, our horses. So, I think we've all had enough of uh, fear and dread. I just wanted to show you Actually, you all know this plant, the succulent plant. This was taken up from the northern, uh, northern coast of the Madeira Island where it gets buffeted with a lot of wind. And this is one of the brush cells. They're supposed to be brush, you know, like we saw in the original ones. It's, I find an enormous amount of similarity between these two. There we have it. So I hope you enjoyed it and I'm open for questions. <laughs>